So that fellow couldn't join the church. He couldn't join the church. He couldn't get baptized. He couldn't get baptized. He woke up with God. He woke up with the devil. Are you saved? Amen. So that fellow didn't take the sacraments. Didn't take the sacraments. Didn't say the rosary. Didn't take the rosary. Didn't tithe. Didn't tithe. He went to heaven. He went to hell. You saved? Didn't keep the law. He didn't keep the law. He broke the commandments. He broke the commandments. He didn't keep the golden rule. He didn't keep the golden rule. He woke up in glory. He woke up in the pit. Are you saved? Amen. You're saved. If you're not saved, you're over here or you're over here. You sure ain't in the middle. He said, Lord, remember me, thou comest by kingdom. And Jesus turned to him and said, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be saved. It's like that. You have been saved? If you ever saved, you were saved like that. All right. In this video, I want to talk about a few things, but first of things first, let's talk about the title of the video here. Andrew Tit is a bitch. Uh, I mean, Andrew Tate. And the whole point of the title is bitch isn't a bad word. It just means female dog. And Andrew Tit is, is a dog because of his most recent uh, video where he's talking to his brother about how Christians should get upset and do something about how Jesus and their religion was insulted at, at the Olympics. But they're not going to do anything because, you know, they're, they're weak and they just pathetic and all this. And I just wanted to let Andrew Tit know that he, he's a, he's a punk ass bitch and uh, he should not just take that. He should do something about that. He should stand up and, you know, back up his own words, right? Do something about it. You see, he, now he is going to have to stand up and fight against anybody who, who comes up against him. And you know how just exhausting that would be? Every time somebody insults you, insults your beliefs, insults your nation, it insults your family, your children. Every time somebody says something, you have to get up and punch them in the face. Let them know that ain't right. I mean, that really? That's how you think you should respond? No, that's how an animal responds. You see, as an American, you should know that we're a free country. People can say whatever they want and as long as they're not harming anybody, they can do whatever they want. So if they're going to sit there and they want to mock Jesus, they want to mock Muhammad, they want to mock God, they want to mock whatever they want to mock, they can do what they want. Let them. Obviously, they just want attention and they want you to get upset. That's why they're doing it and they're doing it so blatantly and out there. They're trying to get attention. They're trying to get you to get mad. You want to do something about it. And you, you ever heard of goading? Where you goad people into something? You know where Jesus, the foundation of Christianity, was insulted, humiliated, taunted, mocked, beaten, and crucified. And he just stood there, metaphorically speaking, and didn't fight back. They were trying to get him to react and to fight back, saying, oh, yeah, if you're the son of God, come down from that cross and then we will believe. You know, we'll believe if you do what we want you to do. Just come on down and then we'll believe if you're truly the son of God. Well, if you're truly the son of God, then God would definitely save you, right? So prove it. All right. That's goading. And this whole thing that we see going on with the Olympics is just goading. Who cares? Why are you giving any attention to it? Shouldn't even be talking about it. Yeah, we know this is Satan's world. We're pilgrims passing through. Yes, of course they're going to do things like that. Whatever. Matter of fact, it, it, someone like Andrew Titt's uh, view on Christianity is way off anyway because he looks at uh, the Last Supper painting as if it's some 
perfect illustration of Christianity, when it's not. Uh, we're not even sure what Jesus really looked like. And we have an idea of how the custom was back when Jesus was having that Last Supper, that they wouldn't have been eaten in that kind of way with those kind of cups and all that stuff. So, you know, the painting is just a painting of an idea of the Last Supper. It's like a whoop de doo right? You can say that the painting is in some way a mocking with some kind of hitting messages and all this stuff. It's 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 not even part of Christianity. That whole painting of the Last Supper, it's it's just a painting of it. It's it's no different than if you took a, a wall and you got some finger paint and you you did your own little finger painting of it. Whoop de doo, right? It, it it doesn't matter if that gets burned down or if it stays there forever. It doesn't matter. It's like whoop de doo. If people mocked it or not mocked it, it who cares, right? Who cares? It doesn't matter. And then he was like, oh, when Christianity would do the Crusades, right? Like he's trying to get Christianity to be violent and animalistic, to bring back the Roman Catholic Church, where it's obviously not following Jesus as it did the things like the Crusades. That's not showing that you are in the truth and that your religion's right because you went and you forced people to become part of your religion sword point or gun point right that that's just how animals work oh i got everybody submitted to me because i'm so powerful and i forced them into my religion oh yeah look at me you're a dog a bitch and you can't handle people disagreeing with you it makes you feel small and insignificant because you have inferiority complex some kind of animal that you have to be on top and nobody has can dare say anything against you or else you're not the alpha dog and you're going to be overthrown and you're you're going to be eating scraps you, you just think of like an animal so that hence the, the title it, it's both to show that andrew tit is a hypocrite because he's not going to do anything about me saying this. Or anybody saying stuff like that about how he's a punk-ass bitch and he ain't going to do nothing about it. Maybe he'll piss him on, but that's about it. Right? I want to see him protesting outside my house about saying that. Or else he, he, or else he really is a punk-ass bitch. And then you Christians that are upset because I say ass and I say bitch, get over it. Just because I use words you don't like, you, you're probably not even listening this far anyway. But if you are, get over it. We're in a world where it's full of all kinds of filth. And who knows what you're letting your children actually watch, unsupervised on their tablets and their phones. Uh, but I say ass or bitch, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm somehow bad and evil. And some of you will say, well, I'm not even Christian, because a Christian wouldn't say that. But then you'll go and say Donald Trump is a Christian when he says he wouldn't even come to God for forgiveness. He just tries to do better and uh, says some derogatory things about women that I'm not going to say here uh, because uh, I got a, a bit of a cleaner mouth than, than Trump. But you're all gung ho supporting him as if he's some kind of savior. But uh, yeah, just some more hypocrisy and stupid nonsense. You know, hence, I got this face painted here. Uh, but there's a couple other things I wanted to bring up. One is the great falling away will happen because the rapture didn't happen. And I, I've been getting some comments like that here and there. Most recent one was on a bit shoot video about my recent video about the timing of the rapture. The person was saying what things I heard before. I heard it when I did a bit debate with that uh, Donnie B fella from stand for bullshit channel he says stand for truth but it, no he's not obviously not and uh, they were saying the same things like if the rapture doesn't happen and the antichrist shows up and you know he's bringing out the mark of the beast all of a sudden all of us who believed in the rapture and it didn't happen we're going to fall away why would we fall away we're sitting here believing the pre-tribulation or pre-time of jacob's trouble rapture and people are mocking us and scoffing us and all this. 
And all while this is going on, we had a uh, pandemic that happened. And I refuse to go along with that and take that snake bite in the arm because I was looking at it as a precursor for the mark of the beast. Right? And so I wanted to be an example to others not to take it, to stand up against the government and the churches and not to take it, no matter what they said and did about it. So... If I'm standing up against that, if I'm wrong and the rapture doesn't happen and this Antichrist shows up and he's going to give the mark of the beast, why would I fall away? Oh, God didn't take me from it. I was wrong. Well, screw this. I'm going to go to hell. That is, doesn't even make sense. Like, what are you thinking we're thinking? Well, if I'm not raptured, I'm going to turn on God. Oh, I could die today. whoop de do. Though he slay me, blessed be the name of the Lord. Where do they come up with this stuff? Matter of fact, it's the rapture that would cause a falling away because you think you're Christian, yet God didn't take you. Now that can lead to a falling away where you're like, whoa, 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 why, why did I get taken? Well, why wouldn't God take me? Why did God take this other person? What's going on here? That can get you to turn on God. It can get you to feed into this false Christianity that's coming around where people think they're Christian when they're being very worldly, trying to set up a Christian nation and a Christian kingdom and imposing Christianity on the world. It's just revived Roman Catholicism and its empire coming back and People are buying into it as if it's Christian when all it is is paganism with Christian names and titles given to things. Like they took their Queen of Heaven Diana and named her Mary. They took their, their pantheon of gods, like the God of safe travels and the God of protection, and they said, oh, no, no, it's the saint of safe travels and the saint of protection. All they did was put Christian names on it. That's all they did. Their Roman pontiff, the head of the pagan Roman religion, we'll, we'll call him a bishop, the bishop of Rome. So see, now it's Christian. Even though they're not really changing anything, we just put Christian names on it. Oh, we practice this, this celebration of Ishtar. Well, let's call it Easter. And we'll have to say that it's something to do with Passover, even though it's not on the same day or really anything like that and uh yeah we'll just put a christian name to it oh we got the saturnalia we'll just call it christmas let's call that one christmas it sounds christian right because it's christ mass it has nothing to do with him it has to do with some satanic being named santa claus who, who who acts like god knowing everything about you when you're sleeping when you're awake when you're good and bad right it goes around the world in one night, giving gifts or, or not, right? And we'll just slap the Christian name on it. Yeah, it's Christian. No, all you did was take paganism and put Christian names on it. It's still pagan. It's like you doing a human sacrifice of some virgins to the Baphomet statue, but you call it the Baphomet statue, the Lamb of God. And now it's Christian. So now it's not pagan anymore. Oh, it's not idol worship because it's it's venerating an icon. We'll just change the name it, so people don't think that it's what it really is. I, idolatry. Worshipping an idol. No, it's venerating an icon. You're so dumb and uneducated. <laughs> but anyway, uh, the last thing I wanted to bring up here was I was seeing these people say, well, if once saved, always saved is true, why does it say here, such as you can read in Matthew chapter 10, verse 22, it says, And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved. So you see there, if once saved, always saved is the thing, why does it say you have to endure to the end to be saved? Right? Well, for starters, you got to look at context. 
And if it's saying you have to endure to the end to be saved, what was the point of Jesus living his life? He's like, you know what? My life doesn't matter. What I'm doing doesn't matter. I'm going to go die to the cross and raise from the dead. None of that matters. You have to do all the work and endure to the end. You need to understand that being saved can mean two different things. It can be saved as in you physically saved, such as, hey, if you don't drink this water and eat this bread, you're going to starve and dehydrate until you die. So I'm going to give you bread and water, and I just saved you. I saved your physical life. And then there's a saving of your soul, which there's nothing we can do to save our own soul. You think if you endure to the end of the tribulation, you deserve heaven and you don't deserve hell? Do you think that's how it works? Do you think you enduring to the end makes you worthy of heaven and you no longer deserve hell? Because that's not what's being talked about here. We're not being told about the salvation of the soul. Not to mention the context has to do with the tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble, where the church isn't even here. Again, tying to the rapture that's soon to happen here. As we look at the context, if we go back to verse I believe it's 17 here, it says, But beware of men. For they will deliver you up to the councils, and they shall scourge you in their in their synagogues. Now, how many of you are worried about being scourged in synagogues? I bet none of you. And even if you are Jewish and you attend some Jewish services, I bet you're not even worried about that. Right? But Jews in Israel during this time of Jacob's trouble, the end, they're going to be worried about that. And then it talks about being brought before governors and kings of the Gentiles or the nations. And then it is talking about brother turning on brother in verse 21 here. This is Matthew chapter 10. And it says, And the brother shall deliver up the brother to death, and the father the child, and the children shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death death. So you see here it's talking about physical death and then it says he who endures to the end the same shall be saved. This is about you enduring to the end of this time you will save your flesh not your soul. And you can see the same connection when you go to Matthew chapter 24 and give me a second here because I'm, I'm flimming through uh, the pages here on this app here, we're told uh, at verse 3, they're asking about the signs of the end of the world and the coming of Jesus Christ. Now, the coming of Jesus Christ is after the Great Tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble. So they're asking about that period and when Jesus is going to return. The rapture is not the return of Jesus. So a lot of people misapply that. And they basically create a straw man and misrepresent people who believe in the rapture as if they say the rapture is the second coming of Jesus. No, it's the sign that Jesus is about to come. Right? And the first thing Jesus says is not to let no man deceive you. And he says all these things are going to go on like wars, rumors of wars, but the end is not yet. And he's like kingdoms are going to rise against kingdoms. Earthquakes and pestilences are going to go on. We see the start of this stuff going on right now. There's earthquakes going on, uh, some pestilence going on, and with Monsanto doing what they're doing with seeds and stuff, you, we, in the genetic engineering of insects and plants, yeah, this stuff is, is going to be happening. We see it's already having the groundwork laid out. And he warns about false prophets, and by the time we get to 13, he says, But he that shall endure unto the end the same shall be saved. And you begin to be thinking, yeah, see, you have to endure to the end to be saved and you think the salvation of your soul. Again, it's dismissing what Jesus did. What was the point of his life? Living his life, keeping the law perfectly, being sinless, and then offering that up on the cross and then raising from the dead. What is the point of that if you have to endure to the end? Tell me that. You're dismissing Jesus and 
the context of what he's saying here. He's talking to who? To Jews under the law about the time of Jacob's trouble, not the church's trouble, where they don't even know about the church yet. And he's telling them about fleeing Jerusalem, fleeing Judea, Israel, because he's talking to Jews about this time. What would this have to do with you in America, Russia, China, Australia, South America? Nothing. Because you're not in Israel. Right? But then you continue on. And give me a second here. He's t this is where, by verse 16, he's telling them to flee Judea. Right? This is when the Antichrist is showing up. And he's saying, hey, pray that your flight be not in the winter or on the Sabbath day. Why would you care about traveling on the Sabbath day? As a Christian, you you don't. But Jews are under the law, do. And in Israel, you got to worry about that. You're going to be sticking out as a sore thumb if you're the only one traveling on that day, right? And he talks about this is where great tribulation happens. That's nothing like the world has ever seen and will never see again. And then at verse 22, check out what it says here. Except those days be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. So you see the context here of endure to the end and you shall be saved is your flesh, your physical life will be saved if you endure to the end. But even if you don't endure to the end, you get beheaded or you die some other way. Your soul is still saved as long as you're death had to do with giving your life over to Jesus. And you didn't just shoot yourself in the head or you die trying to kill Christians or something like that. I don't know what you'd be doing. But if you died because you would not let go of Jesus, you died because you were helping other Christians get away. Even though you didn't endure to the end, you are still saved. But your flesh isn't saved. So you could say, oh, they're not saved because they're dead. So you need to understand the context because there's a save, salvation of the soul and a salvation of the flesh. Just as Paul talks about, I believe it's in Philippians, where he talks about that your prayer and the spirit of Jesus will lead to my salvation. And you might think, oh, so we got to pray for him and then the spirit of Jesus will save him or save his soul from hell. No, the context is that he's in prison. And he's saying, hey, with the spirit of Jesus and you praying for me, I know I'll be released from prison. And he was. Right? So, uh, in a context lets you know if it's talking about the salvation of your flesh, such as saving you from getting hit by a car, but that doesn't mean you're saved from hell. Right? Because there can be a sinner who's never accepted Jesus Christ. You save them from the car, but then they die the next day and they go to hell. Right? But then there's somebody you gave the gospel to, and they've accepted Jesus Christ's salvation at the cross, accepting God's condemnation of them, and crying out to God for mercy and grace, and they'll be saved, even though... You failed to save them from the car and they die. Well, they're still saved from hell, even though their flesh isn't saved, got mangled up and died. So those are th three things that were on my mind. Right. And in the spirit of Andrew Tate, you know, I want to be fire up about it and get all rowdy. Oh, my, I'm all upset because of the taunting and the mocking and. I gotta come down from the cross and do something about it. So like, no. It's freedom. These people are revealing their true colors. I don't want to stop them. I want everybody to reveal their heart. I don't want to try to scare them into, hey, you don't speak out against my God. No. You say what you want to say. I'm not gonna do anything about it. I may say, hey, you're wrong. You might want to reconsider what you're saying and doing. 
but I want you to reveal you. Because you do those things, you have a witness of what's really in your heart, so you have no excuse when you're judged. And it's better than me having a bunch of people who I don't know if they truly believe or don't believe. Because they're afraid to truly express their thoughts, right? And their feelings. But no. Let it all out. Now I know who's on what side. But you know, Muslims, they don't know who true believers are or not. How do you know if your fellow Muslims are only being Muslim because they're afraid they're going to get stoned or beheaded or something else happened to them? You don't know. Because they're not allowed to express their thoughts and feelings that go against the religion. Same thing with the Roman Catholics. How can you know your family? They truly believe. I know they don't quite like it here in America where they have the freedom to speak out against it and not follow the religion of their family. It ain't right. They want to be more like Islam. Force the children. Indoctrinate them. Not allow them to ask questions. Because they themselves don't have the answers. Because they never ask the questions and never look for the answers. Because you don't do that when you're in a cult. In a cult that uses coercion and intimidation and fear to manipulate and control its practitioners. That's not how Christianity is. So, with all that being said, I feel free to piss and moan in the comments. No? Uh, maybe I'll talk to you, maybe I won't. Try to reason with you. Uh, but, uh, yeah, uh, if you think you're right and I'm wrong and I just won't listen, feel free to pray about it. Tell God to correct me. Get me on the right track. I appreciate you pray for me. Anyway, with all that being said, thanks for watching. Take care. All right, I just wanted to make a quick video here to put at the end of all my videos encouraging you to prayfully get into the scriptures. As we read here in Hebrews chapter 12 at verse 2, it says, Looking on to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And this is very interesting that it refers to Jesus as the author of our faith. An author is somebody who writes. And in Romans chapter 10, verses 16 and 17, it says, But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So you see here how Jesus is the author and finisher of our, finisher of our, of our faith, and how you get faith from hearing the word of God. Jesus is the Word of God. The Bible, the Scriptures, are the written Word of God. It is God in our world. It's God's representative in our world. And that would be the King James Bible. And if you're saying, it doesn't say read, it says hear. Well, then read it out loud, my friends. I know some of you are wise asses, and that's what you're going to say. Well, then read it out loud. And you build your faith. And you notice how obeying the gospel here is about believing it. That's how you obey it. The gospel is the good news of our salvation. That Jesus Christ died for our sins, was buried and rose again according to the scriptures. But coming back to the word of God here, we are told in Isaiah 34, 16, Seek ye out the book of the Lord and read. This is very fitting because Isaiah has 66 chapters, just like there's 66 books in the Bible. And if you do a study on this, you can see that each chapter of Isaiah lines up with each book of the Bible. 
the first chapter for Genesis, the last chapter for Revelation. Have fun doing that. And why should you seek out the book in the, of the Lord and read? So that Jesus never tells you this. Ye do err, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God, as we read here in Matthew 22, 29, when he's talking to the Sadducees who are coming to him with a very silly question that anybody could answer if they actually knew the scriptures. But you see, the Sadducees, they didn't use the whole Old Testament. They just used Moses. So they didn't get the light from the Old Testament to help you understand the Torah. Just like the New Testament shines light and helps you understand the Old Testament. None of it adds or removes from what Moses wrote. It helps you understand what Moses wrote. That's why Isaiah tells us here in Isaiah 8 verse 20, to the law, which is the instructions, the Torah, what God told Moses to write, that's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, first five books of your Bible there, it says, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. So you see, you test the people to see if they actually have light in them. There's people who have an outward show of light, as Satan himself can come as an angel of light and his ministers as ministers of righteousness. But how do you test the spirits to see if there's truly light in them? They have to line up according to the scriptures. Jesus was not afraid to be tested in the scriptures. He would say, have you not read? Uh, it is written. To search the scriptures. Bring them up. They testify of me. Right? He wasn't worried about that. Paul wasn't either. Acts 17, 11. He wasn't worried about being tested in the scriptures. He didn't make some nonsense about you can't understand the scriptures. You need me to interpret them. No, he, he actually called the Barians noble for hearing what he had to say and then searching the scriptures to see if it was so. Because that's what we're supposed to do. If you don't line up with the scriptures, you're not of God. Very simple, very easy. God made it very easy for us to know him and to know who is not of him. He gave us his word and it's super simple. If it doesn't line up with him, then obviously it's somebody else trying to say that they're from him, a stranger. Trying to kidnap you, right? And what does Jesus tell us about the word in John 17, 17? He says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So you Christians that want to be sanctified and you're trying to sanctify yourself by repenting of all your sins so that you become sinless. You want that sanctification. You need to get into the word because when you have the word abiding in you, God changes you from the inside out where you're not making the change where you sanctify yourself by becoming some sinless being, by focusing on your sins and fighting against them. No, that's just cleaning the outside of the cup and containing your sinful nature. You need to come to Jesus to be born again, sealed with his Holy Spirit and become one with his spirit. And as Jesus says in John 6, 63, his word is spirit and it is truth. Flesh profits nothing. You get into the word. You are partaking of the Spirit of God, and God's Spirit is life-giving, as we see in Genesis, bringing life to things that have no life. You want that life. You want to be sanctified. You need to get into the Word. As we're told here in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 through 27, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the Word that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So how do you receive this cleansing? By getting into the word. It is spirit. The spirit is in reference to water. You want that cleansing? Get into the word. That's where you are going to be sanctified, so that you would be without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. No blemish whatsoever. You need to get into the word so that Jesus is abiding in you, and you are abiding in him. You see that? So, moving on to this last verse here, John 17, 3. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Because the only way to know the Father is to know the Son. You can't come to the Father without going through Jesus. 
When you know Jesus, you know the Father, because they are one. Jesus is the Father in the flesh. And eternal life is to know them. That's why Jesus says in Matthew 7, to these people who are doing a lot of great works in his name, they're prophesying in his name, they're casting out devils in his name, they're doing many mighty works in his name. And Jesus says, I never knew you. You see, you're saved not because of your works, not because you repented of your sins, not because you're perfect and you've deserved it and you've earned it somehow, that you've proven yourself. No, you're saved because of your relationship with God. If you've come to the cross and have been born again, then you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of God. You become one spirit with the Lord. There's no way Jesus can say, I never knew you, because he knows you. He made you anew at the cross. He knows you intimately. You're saved at that point. You need to have that deep relationship with God. Just as Adam knew Eve and she conceived, you need to know God on that level where you are born again. You receive the word of God, which is the seed of God, into your heart, which would be your womb. I know as a man you might not want to think of that, but that's how it is. Eat the humble pie so that you receive the seed of God that you may be born again. You see, the women help us understand our role to God. Because to God, we are the bride, the bride of Christ. We are as the woman. So you need to eat the humble pie, receive the seed, so that you can be born again. But a lot of Christians, they are just like a lot of women today. We don't need a man. So they're never going to be born again. Right? A lot of Christians, we don't need God. We can do it ourselves. And they take on the name Christian. Christians seem to be the easiest people to fool. Because all you got to do is say you're Christian. And they'll follow after you. You can be preaching lies because they don't test you to the scriptures. Donald Trump is a good example of a lot of Christians just blindly following him because he said he was Christian. Even though what he asked was asked if he comes to Jesus to ask for forgiveness. He says, no, no, I don't really do that. I, I don't really see myself as a bad person, and I just try to do better. So he's not a Christian. He's never been born again. He doesn't believe the gospel, the good news of our salvation. He doesn't even believe he needs it. Yet the Christians are holding him up as if he's Christian and as if he's the, the savior of our country. Right? They're making an idol out of him. And he, obviously, he's a pompous ass, right? And the only reason why he looks good is because the left looks so bad. If it wasn't because of the left looking so hideous, you would be able to see clearly that Trump is no better. He just says you what you want to hear. But then somebody like me who preaches to you the truth, but then I might say a word you don't like. Like I might say shit or ass, and all of a sudden you're offended and you turn off the video right here saying this guy's not a Christian, you never listen to a thing I say, because I said a couple of words that the Bible doesn't say not to say. The Bible doesn't say not to say any words like that. It says not to have corrupt speaking and guile. Corrupt speaking is what you get from politicians like Trump. That lie. And that's what guile is. It's manipulation. Fake feigned words. Flattery. I'm not doing that. I'm not speaking anything corrupt. I'm just instead of saying crap or butt, sometimes I end up saying shit or ass. And me saying that right now, you probably getting mad. And that's probably because you're immature. Christian, or not even Christian at all. You're just Christian in name only. And that's why you follow fake Christians so easily. So if you're offended by such things, have fun. Go away. You're not breaking my heart. You're, you're not taking anything from me. You're only hurting yourself by rejecting the truth and following after bullshit. So thanks for watching. Now I'm going to splice into 
something from Rockman that I really enjoy by the end of this. Take care. That fella couldn't join the church. He couldn't join the church. He couldn't get baptized. He couldn't get baptized. He woke up with God. He woke up with the devil. Are you saved? Amen. So that fella didn't take the sacraments. Didn't take the sacraments. Didn't say the rosary. Didn't take the rosary. Didn't tithe. Didn't tithe. He went to heaven. He went to hell. You saved? Didn't keep the law. He didn't keep the law. He broke the commandments. He broke the commandments. He didn't keep the golden rule. He didn't keep the golden rule. He woke up in glory. He woke up in the pit. Are you saved? You're saved. If you're not saved, you're over here or you're over here. You sure ain't in the middle. He said, Lord, remember me, thou comest thy kingdom. And Jesus turned to him and said, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be saved. Just like that. You have been saved? If you ever saved, you were saved like that.